Good morning, folks. Um, I'm slightly disappointed that there was no hiccup there. Uh, at any rate, my name is Doug Anderson and uh, Micah has invited me to speak today. And so, uh, so here we go. So imagine it's Friday night, you kick off your shoes, it's time to hang out, just, you know, end of the work week. You click on your current show and you watch an episode or five of your favorite sitcom. Uh, now you might be more cultured than I am, uh, but at times a sitcom just hits the spot, right? There's little engagement, big on distraction, a few relaxed laughs, and importantly, there's an absolute lack of character development. In fact, this is partly why they work, right? The story depends on the characters in the show being the same week to week. Um, guilty pleasure moment, maybe you like Seinfeld or Friends or The Big Bang Theory or The Office or The Simpsons or Kim's Convenience. Whatever it is, you're not at that moment looking for Shakespeare, right? We see ourselves, our family, our friends, and our co-workers in these shows. And we get to know the characters and love them and all of their quirkiness. We can describe their personality, you know, of our favorite characters. And if we play, pay close attention, we get a sense of what they believe, what they believe about themselves, the world, and what matters in life. We see this in what they say, as well as how they act and how they act and react, right? What they believe affects how they feel and act. Now, while comedy is a real gift and I'm a big fan of it myself, in the end, one doesn't want their life to have been a comedy, right? We want character development. We want to see change in our lives. We want to have growth and depth and maturity. During the pandemic season, many people have really struggled with their mental health. Uh, people are experiencing significant stress for a variety of reasons. And sometimes this is leading to anxiety and depression. Uh, as a family doctor, I can assure you, I see this daily. It turns out that the connection between what we believe and how we feel and act goes pretty deep. We have learned that part of the way we experience the things that happen in our lives is through the lens of what we think, what we believe. When we're experiencing depression or anxiety, our thoughts become distorted, defaulting to a particularly negative way of interpreting and reacting to events, which then affects our behavior and worsens our emotional state. Maybe this has happened to you or someone close to you. Part of the treatment is to nudge the thoughts and behaviors back to more healthy patterns, and the feelings will start to follow. The point is this, uh, what we think and believe matters. And just like our sitcom characters, we, in a sense, live out of our beliefs. And this includes what we believe or don't believe about God. Uh, the pandemic has not only isolated many people from their friends and families, for some, it seems to have cut them off from what provided meaning in their lives. And some are asking, what is life all about? Maybe these questions about meaning will last, maybe they won't. But if asked, are we as Christians ready for their questions? We're in the midst of a sermon series uh, looking at 1 Peter. Micah began with four sermons on the context we find ourselves in. Being chosen yet exiled, having a living hope, redefining holiness, and reflecting on suffering. Last week, uh, we began a section on four capacities, foundations for a healthy church. And last week, Micah looked at liturgy, how the world offers us a liturgy, shaping our desires, what we love, right? And we began, I think, a conversation on how our communal church life might form our desires and how good liturgy helps to restory us, right? I love that line. How, how liturgy helps to restore us. So keep that in mind. We'll come back to that. So today we are discussing theology. And I'm aware that even mentioning the word can cause a small elevation in some people's blood pressure. Uh, my introduction was an attempt to show that our beliefs about life, including thoughts and beliefs about God, they're already there. We all have them. They are the water we're swimming in. The word theology simply means words about God. Words you say, words you think, words you believe. Your theology is what you believe about God. So really, we are all theologians. 
As I was preparing for today, Micah gave me a very helpful definition. Good theology is rightly ordered and understood story, right? Good theology is rightly understood, sorry, ordered and understood story. And again, we'll look at the story in a moment. Jesus said, as we heard, I uh, read so well today, uh, that the greatest commandment was to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. Sometimes Christians have been better at doing the first two. In a book called The Scandal of the Evangelical Mind, the historian Mark Knoll stresses the importance of making the effort to think within a Christian framework across the whole spectrum of life and learning. The scandal is that too often in Christian circles, there has not been an effort to really think things through. So good theology is loving God with our minds. We are all theologians. And good news, we are all learners, right? So what is this story, this big story, sometimes called the grand narrative of Scripture? It might be told something like this, okay? Big breath. In love, God created a good world to dwell among his image-bearing children in peace, in shalom. The rebellion and sin of the fall severed this communion and the harmony of his creation, resulting in spiritual and physical death. God set about to rescue and redeem his creation through the call of Abraham and Israel to bless all the families of the earth. Despite the repeated failings of Israel and its people, a remnant would repeatedly spring up until the task of Israel becomes focused on one person, Jesus, who is God himself, rescuing his creation from within. Jesus' self-sacrificing death is followed by his resurrection, announcing victory over death and a new creation, which is a foretaste of God once again dwelling with his people. In hope, we look to the future restoration of all things as a new heaven and a new earth, God's kingdom come. For now, church lives by his spirit. His church lives by his spirit, proclaiming that Jesus is the true king, acting as his ambassadors, his hands and feet in the world, in order to bless all the families of the earth. So this story tells us who God is and how he is working in the world. It is the backdrop of all the biblical stories, the story of all humanity. It's the backdrop of the whole cosmos, and it's the backdrop of your story. This big story is where we begin with words about God, with theology. So Tom Wright says, the problem with theology is as soon as you say anything, someone will say, well, you didn't say this. So if you don't say everything every time, people think you left something out that was important. Uh, that's why he says he writes such long books. Uh, so please understand, today's window on theology is part of a series which includes other capacities, other aspects of our Christian life. True, we are not saved by mere belief. Knowledge at times puffs up. Yes, we need transformed hearts. We need the Spirit to live in us. I like what uh, G. J. Kesterton said about uh, Christian creed. He said, his belief in the creed was less of a theory, more of a love affair. Uh, but that being said, we ignore the mind at our peril. John Calvin said, the human mind is a perpetual factory of idols. And again, Tom Wright adds that many people create a Jesus that is an idol of their own making. So if we don't understand good theology, we are vulnerable to trying to treat our stressed feelings and personal shortcomings with bad theology. Remember, not all thoughts are great and not all beliefs are true. We might be tempted to follow a prosperity gospel or to seek spiritual experiences just to numb our pain or become a protectionist church hiding out, just waiting for the end. Right? Jesus told stories uh, that were surprising and they showed God to be different and to be working differently than what people expected. So it helps to know this story. I'm just going to warn you, I seem to be under the nexus of the uh, Snowbirds flight plan this morning. So, so if I look like the, the screen is frozen, but I'm still blinking, it's probably because I can't hear myself think. Uh, so turning to 1 Peter, 
Uh, surprise, surprise. We find that thoughts, feelings, beliefs, and actions, they're all interrelated. In chapter 1, verse 8, he says, although you have not seen him, you love him. Even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. There it is, believe and rejoice. We believe in him and we feel glorious joy. And then regarding the life of the mind, in chapter 113, Peter says, therefore, prepare your minds for action, discipline yourselves. And again, in chapter 3, second half of 15, always be ready to make your defense to anyone who demands from you and accounting for the hope that is in you. Right? Peter says, prepare your minds, be ready to make your defense. Do you see what he's saying to us? Prepare your minds so that you behave well and prepare your minds so that you explain well. And it goes the other way too, in just after that in 13, uh, sorry, chapter 3, 16, he says, keep your conscience clear. And I think what he's getting at here is behave well and you won't have the baggage of a guilt cluttered and messed up mind. Uh, some of my worst thinking and behavior has come from being in a tangle of guilt. So Peter is telling us to prepare our minds to think. Remember, this is Peter. In the Gospels, uh, he was not the poster child for careful consideration and calm reflection prior to action, right? But Peter has changed. He has grown into a new understanding of himself and how to follow Jesus and how to lead others. Unlike those sitcom characters, Peter has developed. His theology has grown. Prior to Jesus' uh, resurrection in Pentecost, we saw Peter was a rough but lovable character, always mentioned first, a real leader, but brash and impulsive, somewhat thick-headed and pretty sure of himself. And yet he was also at times fearful, even cowardly. Eugene Peterson says it like this, Peter seems to have been a natural leader, commanding the respect of his peers by sheer force of personality. He was easily the most powerful figure in the Christian community. He could easily have taken over. He had in him all the makings of a bully, and religious bullies are the worst kind, Peterson says. But he didn't become a bully. Instead, he became a boldly confident and humbly self-effacing servant of Jesus Christ. Throughout this letter, we see Peter as a caring and thoughtful leader. Uh, he's not grasping power or pushing his way around. Instead, he is concerned about kindness, humility, and even being a good, stabilizing citizen. Yes, there is a revolutionary aspect to the faith, but it looks nothing like rebellion had ever looked. So since we're talking about theology, what do we see of Peter's theology in the letter? You know, there's a lot here, so we're just going to look at a few themes. Um, first of all, regarding God. So one of the key stories about Peter in the Gospels is when Jesus asks, who do you say that I am? And in a dramatic moment, right, Peter confesses, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So who is God? In the first verses of this letter, Peter describes what theologians will later refer to as the Trinity, right? So in chapter 1, verse 2, to the exiles of the dispersion who have been chosen and destined by God, the Father, sanctified by the Spirit to be obedient to Jesus Christ and to be sprinkled with his blood. And over the course of this letter, we learn that, among other things, God the Father is holy and can be trusted. Through God's love, Jesus was destined for the purpose of redeeming us, and he is an example to us right? Jesus is our example. The Spirit acts to make us holy, to sanctify us, and inspire the scriptures Peter refers to, which for us are the, is the New Testament. Here's another theme, temple. During this time, the temple in Jerusalem was the center of Ju uh, Jewish religious practice, but for Peter, this has changed. Instead of going to the temple to offer sacrifices, Peter says in chapter 2 that followers of Jesus, and this means us too, are living stones built together around Jesus, the cornerstone into, cornerstone, into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices to God through Jesus. And in 2.9, he says, he refers to them as a royal priesthood, 
So every believer is now a priest and royal because Jesus is king. He calls them a holy nation, not a political nation state, right? There's, there's a lot in there. Uh, another theme, holiness. A few weeks ago, Mike explored the idea of holiness, clean and unclean, looking at how Peter's theology changed. He, has, he had seen the Jews as set apart, and a list of rules helped maintain their purity. But Micah, I think, really helpfully explained to us how, how God's holiness is not a fragile thing that is corrupted by contact with the unclean. Rather, contact with the holy makes the unclean clean. And we read in Acts 10 and 11 that after Peter had the visions of the blanket of foods coming down, he understands that Jesus came to welcome all peoples. In, back in 1 Peter, in uh, chapter 2, verse 9, Peter goes on to see this family of God is like a new race, a non-race race, in which spirit is thicker than blood, right? How much does our world need this news now, right? Peter says, once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. This is a revolution. This is a theology of welcome. And there are other themes, such as Peter's view of suffering, I don't know if you noticed, but Micah dropped a bomb on us a few weeks ago when he pointed out, how you suffer shows what you believe. Uh, that is deep water, and I think it's worth really thinking about. These themes, unclean, clean, suffering, holiness, temple, race, king, God as father, son, and spirit. Each of these words has for Peter a new and deeper meaning. He has come to understand the big story of who God is and how he is working in the world. Peter's Jewish worldview has been developed. It's been transformed. The story of God's rescue has moved to the next chapter. What Peter believes, his theology has grown. Not only that, we see time and again uh, in the book of Acts that Peter is able to tell the story, to give an account of his faith and why he has hope. This guy lives what he believes. When someone who is hurting asks, asks us why we have hope, it helps to know the story. We are witnesses to Jesus' love, and living by his spirit, we are his hands and feet. We are meant to be a blessing to all the families of the earth, right? It's in the story. So how do we keep learning and thinking through the implications of this story? Well, if you haven't been reading the Bible, now is a great time to start. And if you have but find it tough, here are a few things that have helped me. You know, when you're deep in the weeds of reading the Bible, it can be confusing and even disturbing, especially when I'm reading the Old Testament. I'm reminding what a cross-cultural experience it is. So here's my advice. Don't read alone. Have a guide. Uh, have someone who can help you see the big story, the grand narrative, and how the part you were reading fits into that. Uh, there are many very thoughtful people who have devoted their lives to considering these things and have spent a time that most of us don't have, and we can learn from them. And uh, certainly being a part of Living Hope or your local church is a great start. A thoughtful pastor such as we have in Micah is a true gift. And now that we're all good on YouTube, uh, we can listen and re-listen to his sermons. So here are a bunch of other suggestions. I know you don't have time for all these, uh, but you might have time for one and one or two of them, uh, please let's talk and share with one another about what you have found helpful or perhaps where you feel stuck and let's learn from each other because we don't do this alone. So consider joining a small group in our church, a small group Bible study. Uh, read the stories and wrestle with them in the company of sisters and brothers in the faith. Remember the commandment was to love with our hearts and souls, not just our minds. Being in community is helpful for a thousand reasons. Um, with regard to it, a great resource about the Bible itself, uh, some of you may know about the thing called the Bible Project. Uh, pastor Tim, Mike, uh, Tim Mackey, who is a pastor and he has a PhD in Hebrew. I think he's almost as smart as Mary Beth. I'm not sure. Uh, at any rate, these are, these are animated, uh, short sort of um, uh, summaries of each of the books of the Bible, five minutes, six minutes, seven minutes, but he's very good at placing them in that bigger story. 
Um, Jackie and I right now are reading through the Bible and uh, using that uh, uh, Bible project uh, structure and these videos come up and they're very helpful. Um, the same fellow, Tim Mackey, has a podcast, My Strange Bible, which right away tells you that this is a guy who understands uh, that we have to make some cultural leaps to, to understand these things. Um, maybe consider joining an alpha group. I'm sure Krista would love to hear from you if you'd like to get some more info about this. Another great way to, to uh, learn more about, about the Christian faith. Uh, consider watching the Reframe course produced by Regent College, uh, which is available now online. Uh, when Jackie and I first came to this church, it was uh, being given a, on a, as a weeknight uh, a group. Uh, it's a fantastic series that reflects on our culture and then teaches the story of the Bible, and then it reapplies that story back to our lives. It's really strong on its theology of work, which so many of us spend so much of our time at. Uh, again, best if you can watch on a group, but it is available uh, online. And yes, you knew I would mention this, books. There's tons of books. Uh, pick a great author. You could read some Eugene Peterson or Tom Wright, if you want to go heavy. Uh, C.S. Lewis, um, Mark Buchanan. Uh, there are easy reads and dense reads. Ask a friend where to start. Uh, for the topics I've sort of been discussing, uh, there's a book by James Brian Smith, not... Uh, uh, fantastic as well that Micah was uh, talking about. Um, James Bryan Smith, he was mentored by Richard Foster, Henry Now, and, and Dallas Willard, among others. And he has a book called The Good and Beautiful God. It's actually a series. And it specifically looks at unhelpful beliefs we may have about God and compares them with what Jesus uh, teaches about God. Uh, he quotes Dallas Willard in this book saying, the process of spiritual formation in Christ is one of progressively replacing destructive images and ideas with the images and ideas that filled the mind of Jesus himself. It's really good stuff. Again, great for a small group. Um, here's another idea. Get a really good children's Bible and read it with your kids or your grandkids. Set the guilt aside. Just try your best to read it with them when you can. Micah talked about the importance of liturgy and stoking desire in the next generation. I think the same can be said for learning the story, for sure. Also, I think reading uh, the best Christian thinkers from other places and other times. Uh, some of my closest friends have been dead for centuries. Yep, that's a joke, uh, but it's also true. Um, and from other places, I have a favorite Sri Lankan theologian who jolts me out of my Western mindset, especially on issues of justice. It helps for us listen to the whole church, right? Okay, and, and now for bonus points, as Micah says, how about going the other way around? I love the idea of theology, this thinking through our faith, as being brought to all areas of our lives. So what do you love to do? If you have an hour, an afternoon to do something you enjoy, what is that thing? If you have a hobby or a passion, you may be surprised to learn that some Christian brothers and sisters somewhere have probably thought about it and have some theological reflections that may deepen your understanding and experience of that activity as well as your faith. You can pretty much learn about anything and learn about how it relates to the faith and how the faith relates to it. In a few minutes of, of uh, Googling, I was able to find some, some sort of theological reflections, books, blogs, talks, videos, on pretty much anything I could think of. Theology of crafts, or gardening, or calligraphy, or cooking, or sports, or movies, art, uh, music, architecture. Here's a few rapid fire ideas. If you love science, read some Francis Collin. If you love music, Listen to a presentation by Jeremy Begbie. Listen to how he sheds light on the nature of the Trinity using the notes of a musical triad. If you love cooking and celebrating, watch the movie Babette's Feast. If you think there's no place for celebration, you'd better watch Babette's Feast. If you hate doing chores, read Brother Lawrence's The Practice of the Presence of God. Thinking this way might lead you to thanking our creative God in whose image we are made, right? It's in the story for creative gifts as you begin a sewing or woodworking project. 
It might mean reflecting on our role as garden keepers and the toil of weeding as you tend your lawn or garden. This way of thinking might remind you that because God has welcomed you, so you welcome others as you prepare and offer the hospitality of your cooking to someone else. It could be watching for the deeper spiritual themes, true ones in a movie or a novel. It could be being especially attentive to that person you meet in your job or volunteer work, really looking to see in their face the face of Jesus. When we welcome thoughtful faith into all aspects of our lives, we move past the idea that this part of my life is Christian and this part is secular. It helps us to love God with our whole heart, soul, and mind because they actually grow together. When we be begin to experience thoughtful faith in all aspects of our lives, it leads us towards a contemplative life, a prayerful life, in which we live under God's grace in all ways, in all things, in all times. The Irish poet Evangeline Patterson grew up in a strict fundamentalist home. She described what it took for her to be able to throw herself into poetry for the glory of God. She says, I was brought up in a Christian environment where because God had to be given preeminence, nothing else was allowed to be important. I have broken through to the position that because God exists, everything has significance. For me, it's like this. I've had non-Christian friends who read maybe the C.S. Lewis Narnia tales who enjoyed them, but they didn't see the theological themes. When we as Christians read them and know to be looking for them, they jump out at us. We can't help but see them. As we are increasingly shaped and formed by the Christian story, we learn to think about our lives and think during our lives. We start to see the triune God's loving, saving works everywhere. We can't help but see them. Peter says, prepare your minds for action. Be ready to give an account. Be ready to share our hope in a deep and meaningful way. Let's learn the grand story of scripture. Let's be good theologians. It will not just change our minds, it will change our lives. Amen.